This looks like a sculpture. Okay, now I now I gotta move on from him. There is, oh God. That hair was such a brilliant design choice. Oh God, why? From the time I've been doing Illustrator React, I've gotten hundreds upon hundreds of requests for different artists to talk about and go over their work, and I feel bad that I can only cover so many, and sometimes I'll cover an artist that hasn't even been requested, just because I have something that I can actually talk about for them specifically. But for this episode, I'm just gonna go over people that have been pretty widely requested in the comment sections of the past videos. Also, yes, I finally talk about Junji Ito's art in this episode, but I'm saving him to the end because his art's pretty freaky looking, and some people might want to switch off before that. That. I'll give a warning when I'm about to talk about his work. But let's go over some more normal art first. This looks like a sculpture. Like looking at it from a distance, I might have thought it was, I don't know, but not hand-drawn. This is incredible. The depth to everything, the pattern on Killer Croc, how it becomes less detailed as it goes into the lighting because it would be more washed out, and then in the spot in between where it would be kind of half in shadow, half not, is where it's the most detailed. And, oh, it's, th this is almost kind of like Alex Ross's art, except he's doing it all with just black and white. And I love, while well, everything is so realistic and beautiful, then Batman's cape is very angular and sharp. And even, I love the detailing on the bottom side of Robin's boot. Okay, maybe I'll look at one more piece of Libermejo's work. And I love how he's left the sky just a blank white to give us a little bit of breathing room and make Batman's head and Catwoman's head really stand out. And then the building in the bottom here underneath Batman starts the framing for all this other stuff that's going on in the image. But really, the thing that gets me about this is how it's so detailed and it's not done with cross-hatching like most comic artists will do. It's just done with different levels of solid black and white. Now, I've flipped through Toriyama's work a few times considering talking about him for an episode, and I was surprised it was a lot more simple than I was expecting it to be. I don't mean that in a bad way, I, I really like the artwork, but the things that stand out to me most from his work, and specifically his character design, is with Goku, that hair was such a brilliant design choice. Because for character design, you're generally supposed to try and make something that looks good as a silhouette. If you black out this image, you can still tell that it's Goku. And I think that hair was actually inspired by Astro Boy, not 100% sure on that, but you can see that Goku's hair kind of looks like a more dramatic version of Astro Boy's hair. And something else I often notice when looking at Toriyama's work, or just any Dragon Ball art, whether it's from the anime or whatever, is what I refer to as the Dragon Ball bicep. See, on the back side of your arm, even on a really muscular bodybuilder type person, there won't often be a defining line on the bicep there. There's the bicep, the brachialis, and the tricep, and they can kind of all blend together even on a really, really fit person. Whereas on the other side of the arm, even when a person isn't super muscular, there's a line here kind of defining the separation from the bicep and the other muscles more. But Dragon Ball characters tend to have that line on both sides of the arm, which isn't particularly realistic, but is a good thing to show people that if you come up with a version of anatomy that works for your art, people can end up loving it and it can become very iconic. If you blocked off the rest of Goku and just showed me his arm in this image, I would still be able to tell that this is Dragon Ball artwork. This kind of art isn't even my usual go-to sort of style, but Asad Ribic's painting is just so beautiful. And I love how he's distanced the sort of airships in the background. One is closer to us, but is all washed red like the clouds. And then the next one's even farther back and is almost just a silhouette, but has little flecks of detail in it. I love Thor's swing here, and this whole style reminds me a little bit of Das Pastoris' rendering style, who I talked about in the second episode, except Asad Ribic's art feels more fitting to mainstream superhero comics because of the way he does his character shapes and anatomy. But I also love in this image how there's sort of a red swoop 
that takes us down to Thor, and then where Thor is, everything around him is kind of a bluish green color, and then his cape is red, his skin is done a little bit red, so he really pops out, and he's the last bit of red as your eye flows down through the image to him. So it makes him really stand out, and oh, I didn't even notice these people in the background that are silhouetted as well. That's kind of cool. I also love his Fantastic Four cover that he did for Fantastic Four number one recently. I don't really have anything interesting to say about it. I just think it's a really great cover, so I'll put it up here now. There's so much iconic stuff about David Finch's art. He's the kind of artist that I look at his work and I instantly know it's him. And he's one of the few artists that I actually prefer his work when it's not colored, because I think he just does such a great job with his cross-hatching. He has this specific kind of cross-hatching that I've seen other artists replicate it since, but I'd never seen someone do cross-hatching like him until he did it. Although I should point out that, well, David Finch does do this cross-hatching in his penciling, the finalized inking that you're seeing here was done by Joe Weems over the pencils by David Finch. And one of the things that also really stands out in his work is how intricately he'll do forearm muscles. Forearms have a lot more small specific muscles than most other parts of the body, and a lot of the time they're just hidden on normal people, but obviously on superheroes and super shredded people in real life you can see them a lot more clearly. And he does a really impressive job rendering those out on pretty much all his characters unless they're wearing gauntlets or something. I think, personally, the reason I'm not normally more drawn to his artwork, and this is purely personal preference, not a comment on the quality, is just how small he draws eyes, because as someone who has an animation background and who likes cartoonier art, I like bigger eyes and bigger expressions. But again, personal preference. His art is really fantastic. If you want to learn to draw like him, he's got a course up on this site called, I think it's Naumon Workshops, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'll put a link in the description, because he does a very elaborate course on how to draw the way he draws anatomy. Uh, this is just such a fun image. All of Gabriel Piccolo's work has so much life and personality to it. And this isn't actually an image he did for a comic, he does a lot of really great Teen Titans fan art kind of stuff. And it's all super gorgeous, and his characters are all really simple, and he makes it look so easy. Like, you look at this and you might even think, oh hey, I, I could probably do that. But it's so deceptively difficult to do characters this simple, this well, with this much confidence. And another thing that I really like about it is how the lighting is done purely in the colors. If you took all the color out of this and just had it in the inks, you wouldn't be able to tell that that streak of lighting is coming in from outside. It could have been that the lighting was coming from the ceiling or something like that. If he was working with a colorist, he would either have to tell them that that's what he wants the lighting to be doing, or more likely he'd have to imply it with a bit of line work or even some thicker line work to show this is what the lighting's doing in this scene, make sure you're doing that with the colors. Because he's doing all of the art in this himself, he just knows what he wants to do and doesn't have to imply it in the inking and can do the lighting purely in the coloring stage. Oh, wow. Satomu Nihei I hadn't heard of before, but these are all really nice. This image here jumps out the most to me because of a, a few things. One, just how the character really stands out because of what a high point of contrast they are. She's all white against the almost totally blackness of space. But then what also really impresses me about it is how he's done the detailing on this pipe thing. He's done such an incredible job with the consistency of this curved pattern. I kinda wanna guess that he did this with a computer program or plugin or something, but if he genuinely just did that by hand, that is mind-blowing. And something else I'm noticing looking through the other images that are popping up for his work, is he really likes making a character feel really small. Like, there's a bunch of shots, whether it's just a person in an environment that is crumbling, or there's, there's this one where this silhouette of a person is facing down this giant creature, and your eye is really drawn to the person, because again, like in that first image, they're the highest point of contrast, and then there's just this huge, freaky beast that he's done a good job making it feel bigger and a bit more in the distance by having this smoky cloud in the environment separating the, the main character from the background creature. 
Yeah, a lot of these images, the, the, the people just feel so small in comparison to the big epic stuff going on around them. Andrew Wildman isn't actually an artist I'd heard of before, but I, looking at some of these images, they're just so, so great. It's all Transformers art that I'm looking at, which a lot of people have been asking me to look at more Transformers work, and I'm actually surprised that I haven't yet because I love these so much. It's so much my kind of thing, not just because Transformers is also an animated series and my background's in animation. I really love drawing characters with blocky, bigger forearms and feet and hands and fists, and Transformers just inherently look like that. And I love how in these drawings, these specifically ones that he hasn't done for a comic, ones that he's done as fan art for presumably for conventions or something like that, I like how the lines aren't all finished. A lot of them are really just stroked in quickly to imply that there's some lining or a bevel or something like that. Something that I personally did a lot and still kind of sometimes do is feel the need to do a very sharp, finished, clean line to make something look good, when really you can make just as fantastic artwork by having more smooth, fluid lines that don't necessarily all complete and go exactly where they're supposed to go. You can do lines a little bit rougher and still have them look really fantastic. This, to me, and any drawing of Spider-Man done by Mark Bagley is just the iconic Spider-Man artwork. I know I've talked a bunch about how I really love Umberto Ramos's art, specifically when he's drawing Spider-Man, but Mark Bagley just the poses he draws Spider-Man in, the big eyes, the way he draws the hands, and he makes Spider-Man thin, muscular, not too bulky, like he actually looks like an acrobat. Everything about it is so perfect, iconic Spider-Man to me. And to be fair, I'm very, very biased on this one because Ultimate Spider-Man, which Mark Bagley did the art for and Brian Michael Bendis did the writing for for something like 18 volumes that was the longest running writer artist team up in the history of comics. I don't know if that's still the case, it was when it finished, but that's the series that I read as a kid that got me into comic books. So again, very, very biased, but just his pose work is all great. And right now, I haven't read it yet, he's working on a comic called Spider-Man Life Story, which is going through Spider-Man's life as if time moved normally and he aged normally. You know how in comics there's kind of a floating timeline? Well, in this, Spider-Man's actually a teenager in the 60s and ages normally as time goes on. I haven't read it yet, but apparently it's really good and Mark Bagley's back doing the art for Spider-Man, so I'm super excited to read that. Uh, I hope I don't get flagged for the bloody spurt here, but I love this drawing so much. Scotty Young's art is all... It, he's another artist whose work is all super lively and fun. It's very cartoony. He's done work for Marvel as well. Even when he was doing that, he was working pretty cartoony, though a little bit more normal comic booky. But his art is just so cool and lively and expressive. And this one specifically, I really love because of how all these very bluish, purplish creatures are framing our main character there. I haven't actually read I Hate Fairyland, but I've been wanting to get to it because his art is just so great. And all the expressions on these weird creatures, their teeth are all weird. Oh, and then this little bug guy with a gun shooting at one of the creatures. He looks so disinterested in what's going on. But mainly I just love how they're all framing this main character. It's really great. Okay, fair warning, I'm about to move on to Genji Ito. His art is famously very freaky looking. Specifically want to warn anyone with trypophobia or arachnophobia. There's some stuff that might set you off, but his art's pretty fascinating, so might be worth pushing through anyway. Okay, let's get right into it. Oh, why are you all making me do- Look, Genji Ito is an incredible artist, I'm not gonna deny that but his work is so gross looking a lot of the time. Not gross looking in a bad art way, just in a, you know, it's freaky looking. And this, oh my gosh, I don't even have trypophobia and this is really grossing me out, which if you don't know, trypophobia is a fear of small repeating holes, which sounds like a very specific thing, but apparently it's more widespread than you'd expect. 
Oh, and if you had that and you looked at this, I just imagine you would faint. It's so uncomfortable. And one thing I do like in this, even though I have no idea what the context is for this image, I can tell that this is a person looking through a window because we've got the sort of streaks going in front of the character, like streaks you might see from lighting on a window, and there's the curtain kind of pouring into the corner of the screen a little bit. That gives some good context for the image, which if this is from a manga, I guess you wouldn't necessarily need it because you're reading the story, but it does help as someone looking at this image not knowing what the story is. And I assume the point of this was to make me uncomfortable, and good job, you've done it, Mr. Ito. Okay, okay. People will probably be upset if I don't talk about more of his work, so let's look at a few more. Oh... God, why? I should say something about the art itself, not just how uncomfortable I am. I guess I talk a lot about how different artists use things to draw your eye through the image. And I guess this trail of scalps is doing that pretty well. Ugh. Ugh. I was already a dog person, but now I'm definitely more of one. Oh, that's so gross. But I obviously have to give him major props for the fact that he's not just making people really uncomfortable with his art by doing gory graphic images, which he does do sometimes, but he's really good at making you uncomfortable by just making creatively twisted artwork and pulling on fears that a lot of people already have, like trypophobia and arachnophobia. So, you know, he's just not going for the low-hanging fruit. He's being horrifying in a really creative way. Oh, look, he did some Pokemon art. That's, you know, still creepy, but significantly less so. Okay, now I, now I gotta move on from him. There is, oh God, yuck, yuck, okay. And last one for today, we've got Jason Fabic. He is really awesome. And I don't really have much else to say. I'm really sorry, he's been requested by a bunch of people, and a few times for episodes of this show, I've looked at tons of his work, trying to come up with something to say, and I just have nothing interesting to talk about when looking at his art. I just really like it and think he's a really solid artist. Actually, wait, wait, wait. While I was editing this video and I was pulling up a bunch of images of Jason Fabix, I found this piece that he did for Justice League vs Suicide Squad, and I really like this one. He's done a fantastic job organizing so many fights in just one image. And we've got a nice focused through line going from Deadshot's arm blast thing up to Batman as our main focus, but then all of the other fights are just so well placed, either hidden in gaps in people's bodies and behind people's arms. And I also like how he's chosen who's fighting who. I mean, that might have been decided in the script. Uh, actually, for a shot like this, it might not have been. It depends, I haven't read the issue. But I like that Superman's fighting a magic user because magic's good against Superman, so that could actually work. Aquaman fighting Killer Croc, they've both got scales and are aquatic focused. Although, I don't really know about this fight here. It seems like one flick from Wonder Woman and that fight's over. But yeah, the planning it must have taken to get all of these fights to appear clearly in one image is really impressive. But all right, everybody, that's all for this episode. Let me know what you thought of this video versus some of the others. This one was a little bit faster and looser and I gave slightly more genuine reactions to the artwork. In the past couple episodes, I've been doing a lot more research into the people before talking about them, so it's not really a reaction, but that also means I can go a little bit more in depth in their process and stuff, so I'm curious what people think about this video versus the last couple. But yeah, be sure to check out some of my other videos. I put out two videos a week on Mondays and Saturdays, and then sometimes more, but be sure to go check out some of those. Got lots of art videos, weird mashups, lots of superhero stuff, some animations, working on an animation now. Don't know when it'll come out, but eventually. And of course, if you've got more artists to request, please put them in the comment section. Been so many cool people that I hadn't heard of that I've checked out now, finding a lot of artists that I really like. But okay, everybody. I'm Christian Pearson, this has been Popcross Studios, home of the nerdiest art videos on YouTube, and I will see you all in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.